FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is August 3rd, 2018. Well, first, as always, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. I'm going to be moving shortly. Like I mentioned before, I just might go take over a Starbucks, see if I can set up my studio there, just to see if I can do it. Uh, kind of like Bill Clinton, why he went after Monica? Because he could. I think they are so wimped out. They are so facile and so, so submissive, like most big corporations, that they'll, uh, they'll let me set it up there. So what I plan to do is take over a table, bring my portable studio, set up a microphone boom there. I'm going to be recording all of this. I'm not going to go to my regular Starbucks because those people are my friends and I don't want to cause them grief. And I'm going to put a sign up on the door, Financial Survival Network Studios, and I'm going to start recording shows there. And we're going to have video for all of it. And let's see if they try to throw me out. I'll be buying coffee. I'm definitely going to be buying coffee. I am definitely doing this once I move, just because I can. What better reason is there? Hey, as always, though, you find us on Twitter, at Carrie Lutz. Find us on Facebook, Financial Survival Network. And on YouTube, if you're there, click that subscribe button. Click that little bell. Ring the bell. My last interview with the SGT Report, Sean, you know what they did? They sandboxed us. We got like 2,000 views. We get 20, 30,000 the last time. You know, they just hate my guts over at YouTube, which is why I never use them as a path to monetization. Anyways, it's time for another Triple Let's Report, and this is episode 459, 459. We're going to be at 500 soon. I don't know what that'll mean, what I'll do, but maybe I'll do something. I don't know. Perhaps. So, like I was saying, we've been sandboxed at YouTube forever. And so, have you noticed this trend? I think it is complete, absolute garbage. And the fact that every major media outlet is pushing it makes me think it's so all the more. And that is that sitting is the new smoking. Now, look, if you sit eight hours a day watching the tube or going on the internet, yeah, you're not getting activity. Your body craves activity. But look, I work at my desk. I have a very comfortable chair. I spent big money for it because I was having back problems at the time. I don't think the chair is what solved my back problems. I think stretching is what solved my back problems. We'll talk more about stretching in a minute. But I think that, that standing is the new sitting. I think it's bad for you. I think if you have varicose veins, if you have trouble with uh, ankle swelling, with knees swelling, if you have knee problems, hip problems, standing is the worst thing that you can do. So I think that uh, standing is going to kill you. You get blood clots, you get uh, thrombosis. Like when you sit on an airplane for eight hours and you've got uh, potential for blood clots that can get to you. Yes, that is sitting, but that's sitting on an airplane with 10,000 feet of pressure pushing against all of your body for the entire trip. This is different. So sitting is definitely, uh, I should say standing is definitely the new sitting. So you got to be careful of this. I think it's a conspiracy of all these desk manufacturers. They make these motorized desks, and you push a button and it goes up. Then you push a button and it goes down. So you're supposed to stand, sit, stand, sit, stand, sit. Now, there is one practical purpose for having a standing desk. Donald Rumsfeld used it, very effective. The key is when you have a standing desk, people come to a meeting in your office, they have to stand too. And the good thing is, the meetings last much less longer. So from that standpoint, a standing desk, it, desk is excellent. Guy I used to work with, David, David got this incredibly gorgeous standing desk. Didn't go down, unfortunately. He had it made by the Amish people. It was an incredible piece of carpentry. 
He used it for three days. After that, he literally couldn't stand it anymore. No pun intended. Yes, pun intended. And he he put it in the corner and turned it into a, like a, a table for putting flowers on and, and memorabilia, tchotchkes, all that stuff. So David couldn't take it after three days. The key is up and down. But I think it is a scam perpetrated by the office furniture industry because, look, Everybody who wants a desk has got a desk now. Everyone has a desk. You probably got several desks if you're like me, so you don't need another desk. But if they can convince you that you need to stand instead of sit or alternate it, they can get you. So my day, you know, I'll be sitting for six hours, but I get up like every hour, get a cup of coffee, get some water, eat something, snack, whatever. I'm up and down and up and down, and I, I don't see anything wrong with it. I've not noticed any adverse health issues. But in Florida, in Palm Beach County in particular, also in Broward, I think in Miami-Dade, got this chain called the Stretch Zone. And this thing has made all the difference for my body in the past year. I have gone for 90 stretch sessions, and... Usually, uh, most of the stretch people are young, attractive ladies, but don't get the wrong idea. You know, they're fully clothed. You lie down on the uh, table. It's a massage table. And for different postures, they'll strap you down. And they, like, push your leg up all the way. And the way they work it is three times for each stretch for each limb. So they push your leg up. They hold it. And they only make it go what they would say three, your pain level, your discomfort levels, three, hold it there for five seconds down up again, a couple seconds later to your level five, hold it there, let it down. And then the third time they go to seven. So that would be your discomfort level, which really isn't much. But since I've been going for stretching, I've had knock on wood here and my desk is wood, even though I'm sitting at it. It's, uh, I've had no back pain, zero back pain, zero pain with any joints, no pain, pain for my joints. I had a bad shoulder for years. They've helped straighten that out. Uh, and I'm working out like constantly the same time I did 90 stretch sessions. I did over 125 workouts over the past year. I only missed five or six days of workouts during that period of time, been doing it three sometimes four days a week. I mean, it's been the best thing. So normally when you work out, and I've been power building too, I'm benching a lot, I'm doing a lot of ab work. I've had no pain. So one time I'm lifting some weights, I'm sitting and it's a curl, an arm curl, you're on there. And I had upped the weight like 15 pounds and I sat wrong on there and I felt my back go out. I used some ice ice packs immediately for the next day and a half. I uh, went there, got stretched twice. I went to the chiropractor once, but in less than three days, my back was fine. And I attribute that to the stretching. It's an amazing thing. Just check out stretchzone.com. Not a sponsor. It's just a company that really has done a lot for me. It's expensive. I won't tell you it's not. But if you're suffering from back pains and joint pains, it could be the answer for sure. And they're very mindful if you've had back surgery, if you've had knee surgery, et cetera, they know what they're doing. All of the people that work there are certified personal trainers, but unlike some, these ones have like a physical therapy background, really great people and totally believe in it. So, Hey, if you're in the Palm beach County area, you get in stretch, we might just bump into each other. Otherwise check it out. I had a, personal trainer in New York who did what she called isolated stretching, lie down on the thing on the, on the table and she would stretch me, but I didn't get anywhere near this kind of stretch. I do it for a half an hour on Saturday on, on Tuesdays. And I do it for an hour on Sundays. And let me tell you, it's just been an incredible, incredible experience. I mean, I just I can't even say enough good things about it. It's been so good. Try it out. You will definitely like it. Hey, so if you heard my last uh, Triple Lutz report, there's a bit of a rant about homelessness in America. I was on uh, almost a dozen radio shows talking about it. I even got calls from people. So 
I've written a new article, kind of a continuation of the last one, called Reinstitutionalization, Make the Homeless Great Again. So look, you know that homelessness in America is truly a national disgrace, but not for the reasons that the progressive left would have you believe. The left are outraged because America is the richest country in the world, in their opinion, shouldn't have any homelessness under any circumstances. To them, the homeless are a symbol of the failure of capitalism. If only we lived in a collectivist utopian society, homelessness would all but cease to exist. But the real truth is that homelessness, as experienced in America today, is a direct result of the failed leftist policies. You might be confused over this, but let me explain why. You thought that the manifest unfairness of our economic system has led to ever higher levels of people living on the streets. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. To understand why we have homelessness, we need to first examine the true nature of the homeless population and then examine how they were dealt with in prior times and prior generations. In my last article, I stated that the homeless population is made up of four distinct subgroups. Chronic alcoholics, degenerate drug addicts, the severe mentally ill, and economic casualties. So let's take a closer look at these groups. Groups one and two are one and the same. It's just a matter of choose your poison. While it's certainly cheaper to be an alcoholic than a drug addict, the end result is pretty much the same. The inability to function in society and eventual homelessness and destitution. Group three is again comprised of two subgroups. The untreatable mentally ill, whose conditions cannot be effectively treated with medication or therapy, and those who are treatable, but for whatever reasons do not receive adequate, adequate care. And finally, there's the group most receptive to social programs, persons who have had various economic calamities in their lives that with a little bit of love and generosity can very well and very easily turn things around. There's also an opportunistic subgroup within this group who have learned how to game the system. They desire public housing and have figured out that homelessness is their ticket to government paid shelter. It's impossible to calculate how many such people this group comprises, but in New York City, we know for a fact it is substantial. Now the left wants us to believe that almost all homeless, all the homeless are economic victims. But this, however, is far from the truth. As a former inhabitant of New York City for over 45 years, and not just lived there, but worked there as well. I worked there for over 45 years. I lived there continually for 15 years. I can personally attest to the fact that nearly every homeless person I saw inhabiting the Midtown Port Authority bus terminal, Penn Station, and other public facilities all fell within the first three groups, all of them. They were talking to themselves. They would make weird noises. Sometimes they were violent. They were aggressive panhandlers. You know, many were also docile, pretty harmless. But there was a significant, significant portion that were aggressive and had a predilection potentially towards violence. They could often be found babbling, cursing, and screaming at who knows what unknown objects or targets of their vitriol. So for the first three homeless groups, there is only one solution to ensure society's protection and to ensure these individuals' well-being, and that is forced confinement in mental health facilities. They have proven themselves to be unable to properly care for their own well-being and by virtue of their inhabiting the streets, inhabiting our streets and terminals, they represent a real potential risk both to themselves and to society. Some of each group may in fact be treatable, and capable of reform, of sobering up, rehabbing, and healing. However, large portions are not and therefore must be permanently or long-term confined 
As stated before, in 1955, there were 550,000 people residing in our nation's mental hospitals. Today, even after the doubling of the population, the number is just 45,000. And back in 1955, it was well before the drug epidemic, so we had many less addicts inhabiting our cities. Initially, what happened was states passed drastic deinstitutional laws to reduce the public cost of confinement. This, however, has backfired them on has backfired on them big time. San Francisco expends $40,000 per homeless person annually. New York City, Chicago, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and almost every other major city spends tens of billions of dollars each year to temporarily house the homeless and provide them with medical and other services. And of course, there are costs that cannot be calculated. By some measures, as much as 25% of those inhabiting our jails and prisons suffer from some type of mental affliction. The homeless often wind up there as punishment for committing crimes to obtain drugs, alcohol, or food. Clearly, they are burdening our overcrowded penal facilities and could be better cared for elsewhere. No one, no one can question that. There is no other effective means to deal with the homeless problem. Reinstitutionalization is the only option available to address this humanitarian crisis. Homelessness as we know it in America today is not an economic problem. It is a mental health crisis. We've embarked upon a 50-year experiment in deinstitutionalization. The results are there for any thinking human being to comprehend. Our government has failed society, and it has failed that part of the population most in need. And the experiment has been a costly failure with billions expended annually and no hope of controlling the problem, let alone solving it. It is time to take a look a new look at involuntary commitment and involuntary commitment of this group will protect a society from the mentally ill, addicted homeless, and it will protect the homeless from themselves and the inevitable predators that are attracted to them like bees to honey until society as a whole reaches this inevitable conclusion, we will only see the problem continue to escalate and get more out of control. It's time to try a new slash old approach that will benefit everyone. So questions, comments, you know what to do. Love getting those emails. Best part of my day, make my day, send me an email. So the Q thing looks like it's getting pretty, pretty interesting. You know, You've got Trump singling out people with Q signs at events. You've got uh, more and more so-called drops from QAnon. If you want to look at them, go to QAnon.pub, QAnon.pub. They're all there, and it's just more and more obvious that a lot of what's included there is true. I'm not buying that there are forty or 70,000 um, sealed indictments. Uh, There's a lot more to that story than meets the eye, but I think there's a lot of sealed indictments. They're going after these people and hopefully we'll all be better off once they've, uh, once they've been taken out and uh, put in a place where they need, maybe if they free up uh, the jails for some of the homeless, they won't even cost us any money. Um, You know, it's just happening. Hey, Scott Adams met with uh, president Trump in Washington, DC. Scott Adams, great author, He does the cartoon Doonesbury, and he was way out there on the limb along with the FSN talking about how Trump was going to win the the election months before it happened. And I knew it was going to happen, like I've told you before, just like I knew that Bitcoin was going to crash. So Bitcoin was going up, and then lo and behold, they slam it. And Yeah, I totally believe the price of Bitcoin is manipulated, but it's easier to manipulate Bitcoin than it is to manipulate other markets. Right now, it's down to $74.15, probably dip down to that $5,000 range. 
Um, you know, it's just not going to go anywhere right now. Gold, silver, hey, they've been taking it on the chin. But today, and I'm coming to you at 6 o'clock Eastern time, you know, they went up a bit. Uh, all is well. <laughs> you know, it was really pretty funny uh, watching it. They were up 10 bucks the ounce, wound up, uh, gold finished up 610, and silver finished up 9, gold at 12, 13, 30, and silver at 15, 38. Uh, any up day is a good day, especially on a Friday for precious metals. But don't worry about it. We're buying them for insurance and we're buying those stocks because we're going to get huge gains further on down the road. Of that, I am almost certain. Uh, I'm pretty certain of it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, palladium, platinum, good metals. But I think for if you're an average investor, don't go there. Gold, silver, you know, cannabis stocks going to be good. I'm not going throwing my hat into Bitcoin yet. It has to break $11,000 per Bitcoin before it's going back up. That's my number. Don't forget, I'm not the world's best crypto expert, but I haven't heard anybody else who called the crash to the day. If you go back and you look in your emails, you got one from me on December 17th. If you're a subscriber and if you're not, go over to Financial Survival right now uh, for S Financial Survival Network, immediately sign up for a newsletter because I was right. I sent, I wrote the article, finished it on the 16th of December last year, sent it out on the 17th. Guess what? G uh, December 16th was Bitcoin's peak when it hit 19,400 per Bitcoin. I knew it was going to happen. I've seen these markets too many times to not know it was going to happen. And this is, it's just normal behavior, but pile on the manipulators and then you got a prescription for a real crash. Uh, let's see if it goes down to four or 5,000 again, somewhere in that range. If it breaks the 5,000 marker, might have to do that another couple of times. Um, anyways, so that's, that's what we've got here. Been another great week. It's great that you follow me. It's great that you come to the website. Great that you listen to the show. I hope you get as much out of it as I do from doing it because this is my life. There's nothing else I personally would rather be doing. So thank you for joining me on this journey. And email kl at kerrylutz.com. Twitter feed at kerrylutz. They seem to be shadow banning me too, along with YouTube. They probably trade notes. Um, the... Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. If you're listening on YouTube, click that subscribe button, click, click the bell so you get notified of every new episode that we put up. Hey, and don't forget, if you're on a PC or you've got a smartphone or mobile, you can go to the Apple Podcast app on either your mobiles, your Apple mobiles, and just subscribe to the show there or go over to the iTunes program or app on your computer, PC or Mac, doesn't matter. Search the store, Financial Survival Network, click the subscribe button about 18 times, and you will be subscribed. The shows will automatically come to your computer. That's it for today. This has been another Triple Lutz Report. Kerry Lutz signing off. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.